Everyone, allow me to start by wishing peace in our hearts. I apologize for the move, but I couldn't resist the board. <laughs> that way we can uh, visualize what we are trying to say. Second, congratulations for the movements. When I first came here in 2011, we were at a very small place that did not even belong to the group. And then from then on, you guys kept moving on, getting bigger and bigger. But we don't measure quality of service by quantity. We measure by people's happiness and like human <coughs> vibration. So congratulations to all of you who put the effort in making this dream a possible reality. Whenever we are facing any challenges, whenever we are deep in problems, we usually take a stance. There is a way we like to see ourselves. There is a point of view in which we like to contemplate who we are. And that point of view is called the victim. We love being victims. And there's a specific reason that we like to enjoy being the victim. If I'm facing any problems or challenges, the only thing I have to do to be a victim is to have my working finger in a proper way pointing to those I think are responsible for my pain. I am miserable because of my boss. I am unhappy because of my ex-wife. I'm very sad because of my ex-husband. They are the reason why I feel so miserable. Therefore, I look for outside sources for the cause of my pain. My ex-husband, my ex-wife, my stepfather, my stepmother. Someone is responsible for the pain I'm feeling. Therefore, I am miserable. Now, there is a big problem with this picture here. All victims are powerless. All victims are weak. And why? Number one lesson in Spiritism. Never believe what you read. In here, you're not supposed to accept anything that we say. You're supposed to ponder, rationalize for your own processing of thoughts. Don't believe what we say. Why are we weak when we become victims? Well, that's because where we find the source of our problems is also where we find the solution to our problems. For example, let's say our car breaks down. And it's the alternator that's the cause of the problem. Now, if I keep changing the radio in my car, would that solve my problem? No. The cause of the problem is the alternator. Therefore, what is the solution? Change the alternator. It's that simple. So if I believe that my mother-in-law is the cause of my pain, <laughs> what's the solution? Change the mother-in-law. <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> you might change the person, have a different modeling law, but eventually she might give you the same hex. <laughs> if I say my ex boss is the reason why I suffer, I'm expecting this man here to change in order for my life to improve. And do you know when that's going to happen? Never. Because people won't change themselves to suit your needs. 
People will not change their characteristics, their personality, to make our lives better. Therefore, as a victim, all I'm doing, I'm prolonging my pain. And since I am waiting for these unchangeable people to change, <clears throat> I create in what we call, in psychiatry, a symptom called anxiety. What is anxiety? It's when we want something to happen, but then it doesn't. And the problem with anxiety is that it changes the way we feel time. Time is directly related to our emotions. Let's say you are with your boyfriend, with your girlfriend, and you're living in hell. Do you know what that place can be on earth? Living with your mother-in-law. And then you guys want to get married, you want to get out of our house, but your financial means does not yet permit you to do that. So both of you are working, and one day, he comes to you and says, sweetheart, I have a bad news and a good news. Well, give me the good news. Finally, we can get married. We can purchase a place of our own, and uh, in about a year, we could be married, live in our own place. Well, what can be bad after this good news? Well, that's because my company, they offer me a position in Eden. I have to stay there for six months. And she says, no way. I will never let you go. Said, no, no, no. I can't believe you're going away. But listen, sweetheart, that's the only way we can be together. Away from your mother's house. You want that house? We need to work for it. It's an opportunity. And after many arguments and discussions, she says, okay, you will kill me to see you go, but I'll let you go. So there she is, driving him to the airport, full of tears, crying, this is, this, this is not happening. He gets there in Italy. Every day they speak for two hours on the phone. And after three months that he's there, he calls her and he says, listen, I have a surprise for you. My company just gave me a vacation, a week of vacation. So wait for me at Austin Airport. I'll be arriving in two days at 8 o'clock in the morning. Now, the next two nights we know what happens. She's unable to fall asleep. She's so anxious waiting for this man. And then the day comes and the plane flight is scheduled to arrive at 8 o'clock. What time does she get at the airport? 9 <laughs> I think she sleeps over at the airport. <laughs> She's constantly checking herself in the mirror. She wants to be perfect for this man. And she looks at the clock and it's only 6 o'clock in the morning. It's two hours to go. She keeps walking back and forth. She drinks from Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks. She doesn't know what to do with herself. She uh, checks all her messages, she loads all the pictures on Facebook, and it's still 6.30. <laughs> the time doesn't go by. And then when it's 7.45, 50 minutes to go, she looked at the monitor, and it says, flight delay. <laughs> uh, now, he's going to get there at 10 o'clock. She has to wait for additional two hours. Those two hours, they seem so long. She's doing everything that she can to occupy her mind. She's buying magazines. 9.50 comes. The airplane arrives. And if Steven Spielberg is there to watch this, this could win the, uh, Oscar. the Oscar. I mean, especially if they are a Brazilian couple waiting for an <laughs> Because they don't care who's behind them on the line, right? They hug and kiss. And after the airport, where do they go to? Have ice cream, uh, restaurant, walk at the park. You guys are all adults, right? <laughs> you know exactly what they go from the airport. They spent the seven days 
having all the fun that they can. And then it's Sunday again, and she has to drive him back to the airport. She's crying. I can't believe how long. It's only three months. Stick around. I'll be waiting for you. I love you. And she kisses him goodbye. Now she's driving herself back from the airport, and she's thinking, did this week actually took place? It seemed that we had so much fun that I didn't feel this week passing by. He was here for seven days. Now for her, which seemed longer? The, way, the waiting time at the airport when the flight was delayed or seven days of having fun? Which time felt longer for her? The waiting time was only two hours. During the seven days, she was having fun. What's the difference? Anxiety changes the way we feel time. In other words, victims are suffering. They're weak because they're waiting for these unchangeable people to change, who never will. And on top of that, they're creating anxiety because that, that's what they're waiting for, for their lives to improve. And as a result, time seems for them longer. The conclusion, not only they are in pain, but their sensation of pain is forever. In other words, there is nothing to gain from being the victim. It's not wise, it's not smart whatsoever to choose to be a victim. Because this is a choice. It's a choice that we make. Some people say, no, it's not a choice. Five years ago, Someone stole from me, someone attacked me. I was assaulted, they punched my face. Yes, that was five years ago. Maybe you did not have control of what took place. But the following day, 24 hours after that incident, whatever you did with that memory, that's your responsibility. There are many neuroscientific <coughs> studies that show to us through brain imagery that our brain cannot distinguish a memory from an actual occurrence. Neuroscientists, they do experiments simple as asking people to look at objects and think about those objects. For example, they would say, look at this chair. And the individual is connected with a machine called an electrical encephalogram. It's a machine that measures our brain waves. So while the individual is looking at the chair, a wave pattern comes on the screen that represents his thought pattern, his thought activity. Then they go for a second experiment. They remove the chair and they ask this individual, I want you to close your eyes and think about the chair. This is a different experiment. The object is not there. They're just simply looking, imagining the chair. Their eyes are closed. And the scientists, they predict that either the wave that will come, it's either a smaller wave or a bigger wave. Now, which one you think will come on the monitor? The a bigger one, a smaller one, or the same? Who says smaller one? Raise your hand. <coughs> who think of the big one? Raise your hands. But the people who are sleeping, can you wake up? With <laughs> 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 two questions. Who is <laughs> 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 <Room is full. laughs> yeah, um, Do you think it's the same? Yes or no? Yes. Raise your hands. Smaller one, bigger one. For the scientists, it's astounding to discover that it is the same one. Now, for them, this was mind-boggling. This was incredible and has, for us, deep psychological effects, <coughs> impacts on our personal lives. This is evidence that our brain cannot distinguish what it sees from what it's thinking. Hmm. What that means is that if five years ago, September 19th, 
of 2010. If someone came to me and punched my face, and on September 20th of 2010, I thought about that punch, for my brain, it is the same as I got repunched again. If a month from that incident, incident, October 19th of 2010, if I think about that punch, it is the same as I got the punch again on my face. Three months goes by, and I'm thinking about this punch. I hate him! A whole year goes by, 19 of 2011, and I'm thinking about this punch. September 19th of 2012, and here I am, full of grudge, or hate, resentfulness. What is resentfulness? This is why I like the board. <laughs> <coughs> Isn't this a wonderful handwriting? <laughs> I really wish I was a doctor. I think it's going to be for next reincarnation, but at least I got the handwriting, right? <laughs> Here it comes. Sent to mean means to feel something. Whenever you see this prefix in a word, it means to do again. And then you got ness, which is the quality of. So what is to be resentful? To feel again. Someone who is resentfulness, resentful is feeling again whatever took place. So now we are in the year 2015. Five years went by. And here I am, full of grudges, full of hatred. How many times the individual have punched me? Once. How many times have I punched myself over and over again? You multiply 5 times 100, 365. To hate someone is not wise whatsoever. In reality, when you hate someone, you are allowing that individual to tell you how you're supposed to live your life. They're in control. Not you. It's very unwise to remember negative things that other people have done to us. It's not smart. Because when they did it, we felt unpleasantfulness. We felt unhappy, miserable. So for my brain, they cannot distinguish if this is 2010 or 2015. Remembering that punch, it is the same as Reliving the experience which brings me this awful emotion. And in that sense, most of us are masochists. Why we are masochists? This is a word which means people take pleasure in suffering. Masochists. They like to suffer. In that sense, we are masochists, most of the, most of the people. Because we choose to remember, to relive, to re-experience the negative memory. Because I'm 100% sure in the same year, 2010, someone gave us a gift. Or we were now to a special place. We were on vacation. Someone hugged us, kissed us. We celebrated something that made us happy. How come we don't live that moment over and over again? How come we don't sit here and think about that moment and tell ourselves, boy, that was such a special day. How come we don't do that? We choose to remember the negative memories over the positive ones. See, memory is just like this pencil. Well, just like our phone. Our phone does not have an absolute price. Our phone has a relative price. If you buy a Galaxy S what? S6? Is that the latest model? Yeah. If you buy that phone in the airport, it is the same price as if you buy it in a mall. If you buy the phone in a flea market, it is the same price as you buy it in a regular store. Don't prices vary 
according to the store you buy it from. So it doesn't have an absolute price, it varies. The same applies to memory. We give value to memories. And unfortunately, we give too much value to the negative memories. And no value whatsoever to the positive memories. And as a result, we are conducted, we are directed, we are slaves of our own negative emotions, our negative memories. So in that sense, who's responsible for our own pain? We are. Back in 1997, this woman was driving her Mercedes, and she stopped to change the, the tire. This man came, took her, raped her, beat her up, and left her to die. He actually thought that he killed her. She managed to come out of the woods, she crawled all the way to the nearest road. Someone was passing by, saw her, took her to the hospital, and she was fine. She spent approximately a month recuperating from that incident. And then Oprah Winfrey invited to the show. And Oprah Winfrey asked this woman, how do you feel about this man that destroyed your life? And she wisely said, no. He harmed me one single day. What I do with the rest of my life is up to me. What a wise answer. Most of us, what do we do? <laughs> they do once to us and they'll continue doing it forever. Because we allow these people to control our mind, our memory. You put a birthday party together for you. You invite 40 friends. One, one tells you, you know, you couldn't buy better food for us. This tastes awful. <laughs> 39 of your friends, they brought gift, kissed you, hugged you, celebrated with you. Who are we going to value? The negative opinion. <laughs> This woman, she comes to my house, she has the audacity to tell me I was supposed to buy better food. I will never invite her, and now we're miserable. We completely lose the opportunity to enjoy happiness, peace. <clears throat> Who are giving value to this illness? We are. It's not the person. Maybe this is an unhappy person who wanted to have a birthday just like that, but couldn't due to financial purposes or have no friends to invite. So when she comes to your birthday party, it's only natural for her to feel upset because you're happy. Natural. She is unhappy because you're happy. She's not an evil person. She wants to experience what you are experiencing. We call this envy. Is she evil? No. She's sad. Unhappy. This is why she made this remark. She was trying to make you upset because she is upset. It's a psychological mechanism to do with our pain. We see someone in our level, we want to push them down. So we have an illusion that they were doing better than them. People at your job, at your home, Friends, they are experiencing some pain, and in the process, they push someone down to have this illusion that they're better than you. Don't allow them. And when I say don't allow them, it's not that you're going to hold them and refrain them from doing this. It's all up here, in our hearts, in our memory. It's a rule of thumb. Only unhappy people Make other people unhappy. Happy people make other people happy. Simple as that. We are living in such an advanced technological age for our standards, of course. 20 years from now, what we do it from the technological point of view it will seem childish. We like to consider ourselves super advanced because we manage to control our natural resources. 
But we still are little babies when it comes to relationship with one another. We spent eight hours going to a school. In here, like Fernando was explaining to me, most people, they don't have their parents to help them with their child. So they send them to school as early as two years old. Then they go through kindergarten, elementary school, high school, bachelor's degree, master's, ma master's degree. <laughs> That's the degree I'm currently on. <laughs> <laughs> you can see how well I'm doing. <laughs> PhD degree and post doc degrees. All of this to guarantee what? Our financial life. That's the reason why we go to school. To guarantee our financial existence. That's it. We learn how to read, write, multiply to guarantee our profession. And how long are we going to work for? How much time do we spend working in a day? Eight hours. Sometimes ten. Now when it comes to relationship, how many hours of the day we are relating with one another? Twenty-four. You're dealing with people at your job, you come home, your friends, and then you sleep next to someone. That's a relationship right there. And when I say sleep, you literally have your eyes closed. <laughs> Some women complain to their husband, you know, you're not spending enough time with me. What do you mean? I just slept seven hours with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about my wife here. <laughs> we spend 24 hours of the day relating with other people, having relationships, friends, co workers, family. Now, how many hours? Do we spend going to school learning relationships? Nothing. Zero. And everything that we do in life is about relationships. And it's amazing that we don't learn or teach relationships. We jump into them thinking that we know how to do this. We learn it from our parents. But what if our parents came from broken marriages themselves? We learn from our friends, co-workers, we think we learn. And as much as we like to think that we are super technological advanced, that we're modern, that we are sophisticated, we allow childish emotions to control our behavior. Am I saying something here completely out of context? You might see someone who is very smart, very accomplished, yet for the simple fact that someone did not open the door for him as he was entering the mall, that's it. He feels humiliated. How come he didn't let the door open for me? He could have at least left it open. I have a friend of mine that he's a professor in a very distinguished university. And he tells me the fights that go on in the academic level. <laughs> the fights that goes on over minimal things. If you get into the politics of science, you will know that it is an institution, just like a religious institution. Because there's a lot of time that it's not about the truth, but whoever is in power. Many scientific paperwork right now discrediting articles that have been published that were not true. The real data does not support the theory behind it. Because this was about who was <coughs> publishing and how much they're getting paid for it. The most distinguished scientific journals are living this nightmare right now because of politics. But what is the drive behind these circumstances in the academic level. Vanity. What is vanity? Is when we think that we're better than other people. So whatever I do with the emotion, with the memory, it's my responsibility. So are we clear here? 
there is no way, shape, or possible we can be a victim. We are all responsible. <clears throat> So the question is, if I'm not a victim, what is the other choice? What is the alternative for me? Being responsible. Sorry to give you my back. <clears throat> this word here, it's a combination of two words. Response with able. It doesn't matter the situation we find ourselves in, we are able to respond. We are able to respond. So, responsible people, instead of looking on the outside for the cause of their problem, instead, they will turn their psychological eyes to look at the inside. The title of our talk is The Power According to Spiritism. <clears throat> Why? Because Spiritism teaches us that no matter what happens to us, we are responsible for that. Therefore, instead of looking on the outside, where am I going to look at? In the inside. What is it about me that creates my happiness or my pain? I'm not asking who is responsible for my suffering. I'm asking what have I done to be in this current situation? It's a completely different way of looking at ourselves. It's a shift of mentality. And when I have the courage, the guts, the strength, because this is not for weak people. If I have the guts, the strength to look at myself as being the cause of my pain, immediately I become very powerful. Which is the opposite of weak. Why am I powerful when I become responsible? Well, let me remind you that if I am the victim, someone is responsible for my pain. So if these people here are the cause of my pain, who are the solution to my pain? They are. I'm expect expecting them to change, and when they're going to do it? Never. <laughs> but by having the perception that I am the cause of my pain, <clears throat> who becomes the solution to my pain? I am. As a victim, who is the cause of my pain? They are. Can you tell these people here to change? Yes or no? Yeah, no. no. I mean, you can tell them. Are they going to obey you? <laughs> now, if you find out that you're the cause of your pain, can you tell yourself to change? Yeah. Yes. Therefore, we become powerful because now we are in control. The question is, if it's so obvious that being responsible is better than being a victim, why is it that most people chooses to be a victim? Well, that's because being a victim is an effortless position. There's nothing for us to do. Absolutely nothing. Now, being responsible, it completely changed the picture. Because here, there's everything for us to do. This requires work, sweat. If intellectual knowledge requires so much years of sacrifice, so we can have material things that are temporary, imagine how much it will cost us to get the values that are eternal. It will cost much more. But we expect happiness to fall from the sky. I'm being very graphic so you could be awake. <laughs> we expect happiness 
to fall from the sky. Peace to fall from the sky. You're not going to find it. I wish we had a box here of happiness. People will walk into the store, here it is, peace to you, peace to you, peace to you. It doesn't work that way. Just the same way misery is a result of, happiness as well is a result of. And I'm not saying anything new here. Buddhism, which was born approximately 750 years before Christ, Buddha already used to say these things. Change requires work. But what happened? Since they require works, Buddhist followers, seeing that this requires so much work, they changed and created rituals with Buddhism. So now they just sit there and meditate. Does that require any work? Christ, he came, told us some difficult things to hear. Forgive your enemies, do unto others as you wish others do unto you. That's hard to practice. So what do we do? We start lighting up candles, worshiping saints, throwing money at the statues. Is that easy to do? Very easy. No, no, today's Friday, I don't eat meat. <laughs> we almost kill ourselves eating fish, but we don't eat meat <laughs> because I'm following my religion to the teeth. Is that easy to do? Very easy to do. So we created rituals to substitute the real work and if we're not very careful as spiritists, we could do the same thing. We come here, we want to get the pets, drink the water, and leave the same way we came through these doors. It must be hard work. Believe me, I wish I could sit here, raise my hands, and free your sins, and be happy to walk. I wish out of love, because I love people. But it's not that easy. You have someone who work his way up to be intellectually evolved and morally evolved. This individual who is in a different plane of evolution, we name him Garden Angel. It doesn't mean it doesn't. Uh, it's not important how we label this individual. The important thing is that you know someone who's spiritually involved, intellectually, emotionally is guiding you, inspiring you, protecting you. Don't you think this man or this woman would give you happiness if he could? He would. But it's not that simple. Because it's a result of our own effort, our own evolution. Work is the way that we develop our intellectuality. Work is a law of nature. Everything in nature works. That's the reason we have our material needs to develop our intellectuality. In our Neolithic age, when we live in caves, we had to come out of the cave. We ate the food that was around and we came back to the cave. Once we ate all the food, what we had to do? Move around, look for different sources of food, and find a different cave. So we were food hunters, place to place. We spent our entire existence moving from place to another place. And then, according to the experts, we found the, one of the biggest scientific discoveries of all times, agriculture. Now we're able to settle. But we had a problem here. We, had, we needed water, so we had to live near the rivers. And the biggest civilizations on the planet were born near the rivers. Egyptian civilization near the Nile River. The Chinese civilization near the Yangtze Yang. Bodies of water, we could do agriculture. But let's say we're a group of people and we're managed to plant rice. And it got to a point that we're so tired of rice that we want to plant something else we don't know, so we start traveling around and we find someone <coughs> who now plants beans. 
So we say to them, you know, we have a surplus of rice. I see you have a surplus of beans. Let's exchange our products. It's a good idea. So you think you have a variation on your meal, and I have a variation on my meal. So exchange of values was born. <coughs> but then it didn't rain for a while. The river got thinner. Problems rose, and we had no rice. But we're still hungry. So we went to the people who had beans. We would like to exchange, but we don't have nothing to exchange with. What are we going to do? Well, give us something that is valuable to you, so we go pass this value to someone else. And that's how money was born. And now that money was born, we could exchange values without even having the product. And from that, we were able to create houses, transport the goods from one place to the other. The transportation system was born. We met with different people. The exchange of languages was born. Buildings, roles, all result of work. But if we were in a cave and Chinese food was delivered to us, <laughs> if pizza was delivered to us, where would we still be living until today? In the cave. <laughs> But if you're sitting in a cave, hungry, you're saying to yourself, boy, this is miserable. I hate my life. This is no good. I don't like my life. We label that problem what in reality is an opportunity for us to develop our intellect. That's what work is given to us, to develop our intellect. Tragedies develop our intellect, but they're nothing but opportunities for progress. You run into a problem, this is an opportunity for progress. But victim, no, why is this happening to me? Not me, 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 me. <laughs> God is against me. Responsible people, what am I doing that is not working for me? What is it about my personality that causes my pain? In the Spirit's Book, and what is the Spirit's Book for those who never heard of it? It's a collection of knowledge. It's a body of information of all the philosophies and science that have existed on this planet with ethical and moral consequences for our personal lives. Alan Kardec is not a person that we worship, but rather someone who was educated enough to put the questions in a logical order, from the simple to more complex one. And in this question, in this book, the Spirit's book, he asked a very important question. Question, what's the question? Uh, nine, nine, nine. <laughs> Question 919. <coughs> Ask What is the most efficient way to improve ourselves and to resist the draw of evil? What is the most efficient way to improve ourselves and to resist the the draw of evil. Alain Kardec was so wise, so smart, that from the question alone, there is so much that we can learn. Mm -hmm. Most people who are not versed in this knowledge, they quickly jump into the answer without comprehending what the question is asking. He's asking, on part A, what is the most efficient way to improve ourselves? What that implies is that there are many ways to improve ourselves. But Alan Kardec is not asking for any way to improve ourselves, but the most efficient way. Let's change the context, and we might ask, what is the most efficient way of losing weight? I mean, there are many ways to lose weight, right? You could have uh, exercise, the carbo diet, the protein diet, and the moon diet. You guys heard about the moon diet? 
You eat everything except the moon. <laughs> Different diets. Now, do you want to exercise or apply to your life any diet? No. You want the most efficient diet. What is the most efficient way to improve ourselves? There are many ways we can improve ourselves. As a matter of fact, there is this man who was 31 years old, and he had been in jail all his 20s because he was addicted to heroin. He was in room 235, and one day he received a magazine, and he was reading all these different articles, and then he came to a magazine about Marathon. And he read about Marathon and the history, how it started in Greece. It's approximately 26 miles. What you have to do to prepare yourself for this kind of race. And then he said, you know, I tried all these different treatments for heroin, and it didn't work. Maybe I'll try Marathon. So he was released. He started training himself, knew how to exercise, he knew how to stretch, how much water he had to drink and eat before the race. He registered, he anxiously waited for the day of the, of the race, and out of coincidence of life, he received the number 235. He ran the race, and he completed it. Obviously, he did not finish first because he was not a professional, but he did finish the race. And that gave him a sense of completion, determination. You establish a goal, and you're going to go get it. Because these things are also addictive. People are addicted to quitting. They read a book, by the 10th page, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do 20 sit-ups, 9, they quit. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and they quit. And they develop the addiction of quitting whenever they confront a challenge. If you read the Spiritist literature, people who currently committed suicide are people who are actually addicted to committing suicide. The book of Yvonne Pereira, she explains how she herself committed suicide in different reincarnations because it becomes addictive. They are faced with a challenge and they say to themselves, I'm going to run away from this, and they kill themselves again. Chico J. Xavier tells a story about this woman who came to him. The reason why this woman goes for Chico Xavier it's because his son was born without both arms. And uh, when he became a, a boy, he was able to walk and run. His doctor diagnosed a disease. And the only solution to stop the progression of the disease was to amputate both legs. So this woman came desperately to Chico Xavier to ask her what was going on. How in this world... If God was good, can I allow this thing to happen to her son? Emmanuel, Chico Xavier, guided Chico Xavier, protective angel, guardian angel, explained to Chico Xavier that this little boy was someone who committed suicide many times in his previous existence. And he did not want to fail the current reincarnation. So this is why he, was, he asked to be born with, without the arms, so he wouldn't hang himself, shoot himself. But then, once he started facing the challenge again, he was already contemplating the near river, to jump in the river and draw. So the disease came to avoid him from running again. What is the most efficient way to improve ourselves? Is running an efficient way? Definitely is a good way of improving ourselves. But is it the most efficient one? Efficient means you get the best result in a very practical manner. You could say to someone, you know, you could lose your weight. What do you have to do then? 
Well, you have to work 16 hours per day. You starve yourself. All you eat is letters without any salt. Is that practical? No. Efficient means you get the best result in a practical way. So now we understood question one, the most efficient way of improving ourselves. And second part is to resist the draw of evil. Evil here is not an entity, it's not a person. Evil is anything that causes us harm. If I have diabetes, is carrot cake an evil thing for me? Yes! And for those of you who love carrot cake, flesh news. I mean, news flesh. <laughs> <laughs> There is nothing carried of that carrot cake. It's just a, a, a carrot made up of sugar. You eat that thing, you're getting a lot of sugar. Before everybody knew, people die of starvation. It's true. But according to the World Health Organization, more people are dying overeating than in starvation. It's a common fact. 30% of our food produced is thrown in the garbage. The problem is never lack of resource, it's what we do with our resources. What we do with our health, which is also a resource. At my job, sometimes I have people coming up to me and say, I am, my liver is killing me, I'm in terrible pain. Well, stop right there. <clears throat> Let's rephrase the sentence. You are killing your liver by what you're doing. All oh, my kidneys are killing me. You are killing your kidneys. It's very different. So evil is anything that causes harm to us. So now that we got the question, what is the most efficient way of improving ourselves and to resist the draw of evil? And the high evolved spirits they gave to Allah Kardec the answer. A sage of antiquity, a very wise man from the past, already told you, know thyself, know who you are. What is the most efficient way to have peace in our lives? To know who we are. How can we be happy? To know who I am. So let me repeat that and I want you to answer. How can you be happy? No, 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 no. To know myself. How can you stop your pain? <laughs> How can you stop your pain? <laughs> How can you create your happiness? <laughs> How can you bring peace into your life? <laughs> now, why is it the most efficient way of learning, the most efficient way of improving ourselves, and to resist the draw of evil, is to know who we are? Well, for the simple fact that how can we fix something that we don't know that it's broken? How? It's impossible. So I need to know who I am. And as simple as this seems, most of us can ignore who we are. We might know other people, we might know our cousins, we might know our, our boss, our co-workers, but we completely ignore who we are. And why do we ignore who we are? Because if we truly find out who we are, that requires work. If I ignore who I am, then I don't have anything to do. This was given to us by Socrates. And what amazes me in the psychological field, you read all these different theories, and they say it after they discover something new about us. Sigmund Freud, for example. What did he say about us? He said that we are like an iceberg. Our psyche is like an iceberg. So I'm going to draw here what it could be a ship. I have to let you know what the drawing is, mm -hmm. because if there's something I can't do in this lifetime, it's to draw. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> Sigmund Freud say that we are like an iceberg. An iceberg is a mountain in the ocean. What you see of the iceberg is just the top of it. If this was a real boat hitting the only this part here, the Titanic would never sink. He would simply push the mountain. But what we fail to see is what's under the mountain. 
under the ocean. The entire mountain of the iceberg, it's at the bottom. What we see is just the tip of the iceberg. Hence the expression, tip of the iceberg. Now, Sigmund Freud said that this part here is what we call our consciousness. I know the handwriting must be ugly, but the spelling must be correct. <laughs> so, what we don't see about us is what he called the unconsciousness. What we see, what we know about who we are, he called consciousness. Our awareness. Right now you are aware that you're listening to my voice. You're aware that the fan is on. You're aware about the light. You're aware that you are in a lecture. That's what you are aware of. Now, then we have our unconsciousness, what we're not aware of. And as you can see by the picture, this clearly gives the entire strength, this shape, who you are. What you don't know about you is what actually controls you. Isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. What you don't know about you, this is what controls you. That's in Freud's wording. What we read right from the Spirit's book? Know yourself. That comes from Socrates, 450 years before Christ. Know who you are. So if I know this, then I'm able to control this. And then Sigmund Freud, he added something else. He said the ocean is the ego. Then what is the ego? Ego function. The ego function is to lie to us. Whenever we have an information that comes from the unconsciousness to the consciousness, it goes through the ego, and the ego changes the information so our consciousness can listen to that information. That's the theoretical part of it. Let me give you a practical situation. Let's say this couple, they are invited to a party. And once they get into the party, the man goes out and he starts greeting all the women. He hugs the women, he kisses the women, he says hello to all of them. And suddenly he looks at his wife and she got this mean look. <laughs> and you know how women can talk with your eyes? As a matter of fact, they can give you a whole seminar just in a book. <laughs> Three days of book. It's in a whole, in a just look. So you already know you're in trouble. So you're done greeting the women. You go into the car. You sit in your car. And she enters the car. By the sound of the door jam, you know the intensity of the fight. <laughs> Because before we hit people, we start hitting objects. <laughs> That's how we do it. So she slams the door, and then you tell, and you ask her, "What's the problem, honey? What's the problem? Why do you have to flirt with all the women like this? You know, you're too much. Now all they're talking about you. Now you're terrible. I don't want to be with you." And out of this fight, someone told me all women are good historians. Because when they start fighting, they say to the guy, you know, 25 years ago, you remember we were going to a same party, and exactly the same thing happens. Oh my God, how can you remember something that happened so long ago? And the man, he doesn't feel. He thinks. It's very logical. So he says, well, if I greet women, fight. Therefore, don't greet, don't fight. <laughs> The next party, they are invited, and as soon as he enters the house, he stands like a mummy by the corner. <laughs> he doesn't even look at anyone. Women start approaching him to give him a handshake, and he goes like this to hide himself because he wants to avoid another fight. Party's over, he's happy, he completed his mission. He's quiet, like a mummy, enters the car. And here again, the door slams. Stop! What happened now? I don't get it. And she says, why do you have to be so quiet? What do you want from me? I don't get it. Everybody now is thinking, 
that you are an FBI agent, <laughs> a CIA agent. Because they're looking at you and said, wow, what a mysterious man. The more mysterious, the more good looking they are, the more spectral they are. They're all thinking about you. He says, what do you want me to do? You want me to go there and judge like a clown? I don't know what to do. If I talk, there's a fight. If I don't talk, there's a fight. You gotta get yourself a therapist. Now that I spoke about the women, let's get to the men. It's not fair for the women, right? <laughs> men are very controlling as well. So this guy, he waits for his wife, and every day she's supposed to get home at 6 o'clock. One day she's caught up in traffic, she gets home at 6.40. Now, during those 40 minutes, he is literally in hell. Because hell is not a geographical place. Hell is a mental state of mind. Just like heaven. During those 40 minutes, she's supposed to get there at 6 o'clock. 6 or 5. He remembers the company party that she was at. He went there, and she and he saw his wife talking too much with this co-worker. Now he looks at that memory. Maybe something is going on between these two, you know? She's getting home too late today. 6.10, he's already imagined both of them kissing. 6.15, and at this moment that we have spiritual obsessors augmenting, increasing, intensifying whatever garbage we're thinking. Who are spiritual obsessors for those who are here for the first time? These are enemies who we have created in our past because of our selfishness that wants to cause us harm. So they become these enemies and they are on the spiritual plane. And since they have all the time in the world to study us, they are constantly watching for our weaknesses. So at this moment, what is he going to do? He's going to use the images that are stored in this man's mind to exacerbate the problem. So now, this man is imagining his wife having sex with his boss, with her boss. Why? Because he has polluted his mind with all awful images. When you are watching a movie, and this movie is negative in content, you are storing garbage into your brain. If you're watching a magazine and this is negative in content, you are storing negative garbage in your brain. So when there are moments of trial like this one, all that garbage will come out of your brain. That's the subconsciousness going to the consciousness. And the spiritual obsessor will use that image, but instead of you seeing the actors, you're going to see wife with her boss, and now he's picturing that this woman is having sex with her boss, and it's 640. Once, he parks, once she parks the car, and she enters in the home, he explodes on this woman. Where were you? I knew something was going on, and she says, what is going on? I don't get it. I was just stuck in traffic. You are going out with your boss. Tell me the truth right now. And they have this humongous fight. On the following day, she's so scared of getting home and having another fight that she rushes through traffic. She almost kills bikers and uh, <laughs> have car crashes. <laughs> and she gets home 5.30. <laughs> Supposed to get 6, but she gets there at 5.30. You know what this sick man thinks now? She never went to work to the new <laughs> <laughs> she spent the whole day in a motel with the other guy. And from the motel, straight home. And another humongous fight. On the following day, she doesn't know what to do. She gets late. It's a fight. Early. It's a fight. So it's 6, 5, 5.55 and she just waits. Nearby. So she can get up. Exactly at 6 o'clock. And when she enters, here go again. You're just trying to make up for the two other days. There is never a way out. Now, if these people seek a psychotherapist, or if a friend try to help them out, 
the friend would say, listen, what you're telling me, I think that you are a very jealous individual. That's what you are. You're very jealous. And now the information comes from the subconsciousness to the consciousness. From the unawareness to the awareness. But before this information of jealousy goes to the consciousness, it passes through the ego. And the ego says, no, 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 no. I'm not jealous. I am protective. <laughs> if I don't protect her, who will? <laughs> now, does protective sound like a positive quality? Yes. Yes? Yes. yes? Does jealousy sound like a negative imperfection? Yes. So, ego has the job to sugarcoat the imperfection. Because I could deal with myself being protected. I cannot deal with myself with being jealous. So the hardest thing for us to do is to know who we are. That's question 919. That question only, the book is composed of 1,019 questions. Only one question can change our entire lives. Only one question. But it takes courage it takes a constant self-analysis to know who I am. How much time do we have? Five minutes? No. No, we have more time. Five minutes. Five, Five minutes. minutes? Okay, I'll speak for another 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> there are many characteristics to our behavior. Many characteristics. Jealousy, envy, Vanity, pride, resentfulness, laziness. These are all different imperfections that actually control who we are. And since we don't have more time, I'll just mention one of them. Laziness. Laziness is a source of our pain. Now, some people might argue, I'm not lazy whatsoever. I work seven days a week. Actually, I do 16 hours per day. I'm constantly on the move. I'm not lazy. Well, there are different kinds of laziness. News flash again. Or flash news. <laughs> different kinds of laziness. Physical laziness, we just want to stay in bed. We want to sleep for 12 hours because the doctor said so. It's physical laziness. And everything in the universe is in movement. What you see that looks that it's a static is a poor perception of our ability to see. Atoms, molecules are constantly moving. Everything is movement. To stay idols, but then if someone moves, then there is <clears throat> intellectual laziness. Intellectual laziness is when people they don't want to learn. They don't want to learn anything. There are some people who are so resisting in learning anything new. My mother used to be one of those kind of people. I'm glad that she's not. But one day, I, she has a very busy schedule. She has to attend a, to different places, and she has about 10 people working for her. And she used to do everything on a notebook. And I used to say, Mother, please, let me teach you this. Ah, I don't want Come on, listen. This is what the computer is for. Your job here is something completely different. The computer can do this. I don't want it. I don't even. I don't want to even learn how to push the power button. This is no good for me. And for many years, she resisted learning. Some people they resist learning. I will never earn, learn English. I'll never learn Portuguese. I'll never. When we say those things to ourselves. We are telling our brain what it's capable of doing. And one day I get there, it's 11.30 at night, she's crying. There are pieces of paper all over the floor because she was trying to put the schedule together and she couldn't. And then she finally gave up and says, okay, I'll learn this stupid thing called computer. <laughs> so I had to teach her literally how to press the power button. <laughs> but today she's excellent at it. She's very good, she's able to manage the Excel sheet. It's 
brilliant to see her. But what the experience gave to my mother was the open mindedness that I need to learn everything that is new. That's the breakthrough right there. It's not just learning computer. It's open my mind that I need to learn anything new. That was the biggest breakthrough. And some people they just resist learning. That is intellectual thing, intellectual laziness <clears throat> at the spirit to center. There are many uh, institutions, and clearly this is not one of them, in which people, as soon as you start talking and having the lecture, they uh, lay their heads on their boyfriend, on their spouses, or the spouses lay his head on the wife, and they go to sleep. <laughs> and this white thing comes out of their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> they have the audacity that they're donating ectoplasma for the meeting. <laughs> At the end of the lecture, you, you, you ask them, you know, you like the lecture? Yes, I did. What part? Well, everything. I liked everything. <laughs> because they fall asleep here. Intellectual laziness. Now, when they go to the movies, there is no falling asleep, you know. Their eyes are fully open <laughs> for that garbage that would not help them at all. The Brazilians here, you know, the novellas. <laughs> There is no desdobramento for the novellas. People are constantly watching them. <laughs> Intellectual laziness. And we only make mistakes because we fail to learn. The romances, these books. This one, for example. What is this book? These are people who failed during their earthly experience. And they're coming back to tell us not to entertain us. This is not past time. This is not movie. This is information saying, listen, I fell in that hole. Do not do the same thing. I'm telling you where the hole is at. Just read it. The information is right there, readily available. You read it, if I do this, look what's going to happen to me. That's the beauty about life. We don't have to learn what someone else learned through their experience. I don't have, I don't have to fail into a hole to know the pain of failing there. I could watch someone who has a broken arm. Tell me what happened. Well, I was walking and I didn't pay attention. I was texting. And then I fell into this hole. <laughs> Should I fail in the same hole? No. The individual just passed me the information. The hole is at the street in the left corner about 100 meters, 200 feet. Watch it. That's what life is all about. Learning from other people's mistakes so we don't have to go through their pain to get their knowledge. Isn't that wonderful? I know here in this physical plane, we need licenses for everything. Licenses and licenses. You're not hired if you don't have some sort of a license, but in life, when you disincarnate, we're not taking our diplomas, and license, or title with us. We are taking the information, the experience, and especially our actions. But if we don't have physical laziness, because we work, we move, and we learn, we read a lot, that means we don't have intellectual laziness. There's a third kind of laziness. It's called moral laziness. Listen, out of all those things I told you, I'm just elaborating in one of them, and I'm cutting time here. Moral laziness. What is moral laziness? It's when we know, yet we don't apply it. We already know what to do, yet we don't apply it. At my job, we had this doctor who was a nephrologist. You know what a nephrologist is? An expert in kidneys. But this man, Please do not post this on YouTube. This man was addicted to what? Chinese food. If you want to die early, you eat that. Oof. That thing has so much salt. Have you noticed when you go to a... Are there any Chinese uh, restaurants? Uh, yeah. You get there, you're hungry, and you say, let me have a chicken fried rice. <laughs> They talk like that amongst themselves, right? In three minutes, your chicken fried rice is prepared. Right? How could it be? Well, that's because that thing was previously cooked. It's stored in the refrigerator. 
and to maintain it that way so it won't go stale, they add what? A lot of salt. Because salt conserves food. When we didn't have refrigerators, we salted everything. So salt has the power to conserve things. Now we can understand Jesus saying, you are the salt of the earth. Meaning, I give you my message and you conserve it by leaving it. That's what that means. <coughs> and, and one day my wife was trying to lose her weight. Me, as a good husband, <laughs> okay, let me help you. I support you. What is this diet that you're going to try now? And this diet, no salts allow it. And boy, did I lose weight, and she didn't. <laughs> no salt. But, you know, that gave me a, such a powerful lesson. Have you eaten without salt for a couple of days? I mean, it gets to a point that nothing has tasted. Because when you add salt to the food, it's not to make the food salty, it's to take the flavor out of it. To bring the best out of the flavor. This is why we add a little seasoning, a little salt. So that helped me interpret even a deeper level what Jesus is saying. Whenever we're going through any experience, the real spiritist Christian can get the best out of any experience. Adds flavor to it. So I learned that. And this man, this doctor, he was addicted to Chinese food, especially to egg drop soup. That's the uh, soup that you drop on egg. <laughs> egg drop soup. And this man ate this. He had high blood pressure. And when you have high blood pressure, the salt keeps the water inside your body. It gets to a point that the vessels, your blood vessels, start expanding, trying to hold all that pressure because there's extra fluid inside your body. And one of these days, he will rupture. And in his situation, it actually made him have a kidney failure. Now, this is a nephrologist. Kidney failure. What is the function of the kidney? The function of the kidney is to clean our blood for us. So now he had to go for hemodialysis, the cleaning of his blood. You insert a catheter in your left arm, you insert another catheter in your right arm, your blood goes through this machine and it cleans for you. It takes four hours, three times per week. It's terrible experience. And your kidney is doing all that for you. When was the last time you looked at your kidney and you said, oh, can you clean the blood right now? Does automatically. Isn't that beautiful? It's awesome. The miracle of the automatic biological process in our body. It does everything for us. And how do we thank our kidneys? How do we say thankful? Just a little bit of wine. Just a little bit of vodka. Just a little bit of tequila. I'm poisoning the poor individuals here who are just trying to do their job, which is to clean the blood from them. This man poisoned his liver, his kidneys. And one day, his veins were so clogged that they inserted one catheter in the left arm and inserted another catheter on his neck. Can you imagine this big hole in his neck? So I walk into the room where he was sitting at and I see this man having high blood pressure with this big band-aid on his neck eating what? Oh, well, we changed. <laughs> Cheese it. Oh you know that commercial with the, oh, the kids ask, where does the cheese come from? Where are they? Cheese it is this thing that's made up of salt. It's a lot of salt. So he was eating this stuff. I'm going to get sued by these companies. <laughs> He was eating this stuff, and I couldn't resist. I said, Dr. Pico, how in the world can you eat this thing? You're so sick. And he said, just a little bit is not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> he was eating cheese it doing hemodialysis, and taking high blood pressure medication. Is taking high blood pressure medication the solution? No. What's the solution? Change the diet. That calls for a lot of work. Do we want to do the work? No. Oh. We want to pop a pill and solve the problem. And as a result, he had a stroke. 
What is a stroke? It's when one of your blood vessels in your brain explodes or get clogged. In his condition, it exploded. Blood flows start going to a specific part of the brain. We don't have the time for the intellectual explanation. And the part of the brain that controls body movements on his right part of the body died. And as a result, now he's leaking like this. Can't work. Cannot travel with his wife. Both kids are now in college. He cannot enjoy life. Was this a lazy man? Physical laziness? No way. He did all these years of school. This is why he was a doctor. Intellectual laziness? No way. He read so many books. Moral laziness? Yes. To know and not to do is really not to know. Didn't apply it. The same goes, my friends, for this spiritual knowledge. And I'm 100% sure that my friend Dr. Pico is sitting at home right now with his body all twisted, thinking to himself, how in the world I could have done this to myself, knowing all this information about kidneys and hypertension. I prescribe medication. I oriented people, and I did this to myself. What that means, the more knowledge we have, the more responsible we become. If we know what we have to do in life, because we're so enlightened, because we come to the spirit, the center of Austin, Texas, and we learn every week, yet we don't apply it, we're going to create the pain to ourselves. And this is just one aspect of our personality. I hope that we all, during our prayers, connecting with God, that's what a prayer is. It's not a bunch of words. It's just a connection with God. We ask God, give me courage. Give me strength. Give me wisdom for me to overcome my imperfections. Give me the perception I need to study who I am so I know what is it about me that creates my own pain. And by doing this, constant self-analysis, we are definitely achieving the purpose of our existence, which is our spiritual evolution, to always move forward, always progress, intellectually and morally. And creating this constant effort, always remember those who are in need. Because when you help other people, you diminish your own pain. So to finish our lecture, there was this American author, who wrote an entire book just to mention one single sentence. And if you are able to remember the sentence, we conclude that our lecture was efficient. <laughs> she says, when she was nine years old, she used to live in, in this big house, with a huge living room with opposite windows facing one another. So one day she's asleep, and she hears both of her brothers crying. She goes downstairs, and she notices that the sound is coming from the left window. She approaches the window, raises her feet, and she sees both of her brothers crying. She started crying too. Grandfather came to her and said, Elizabeth, what's going on? And she said, Grandpa, I am so sad. Why are you sad, sweetheart? And she said, I'm used to hate the little dog. The car ran over the little chihuahua. Both boys were crying over the dead dog. I used to hate him, but why? Well, he came into my room, he tear up my teddy bears, he beat on my carpet. <laughs> I hated this little dog. But now that I see both of my brothers crying, that makes me so sad. And she wept. The grandfather said to her, Elizabeth, I want to show you something. He gently grabbed her by the shoulder and took her to the opposite window. And he said, do you see anything different in the garden? She raises her feet again, and she sees the garden. Grandpa, aren't those the roses we planted? Yes, we are. Let's look at them. So they go out. They are walking around the garden, and she's contemplating the red roses, pink roses, white roses. And suddenly, she started laughing again. 
the grandfather noticed that she was happy and brought her back to the house again. And he placed her in the middle of the two windows. And he said, Elizabeth, I want you to live your life by this sentence. In life, whenever you are situated in the window of sadness, don't forget, there is a window of happiness awaiting for you. Whenever you are at the window of happiness, please remember to help those who are situated in the window of sadness. And by doing that, peace will be yours. Thank you so much for your attention.